Good morning and welcome to the Church of the Holy Trinity. Today is a special day. We're celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, and you'll hear more about that in a bit. Um, you can find the words, though, in our bulletin or on the screen or in the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, we'll give you some page numbers so that you can follow along. But we're going to begin the way we always do, asking the Holy Spirit to come as we join together in a silent prayer. Ask that in your heart, wherever you are and whenever you are. Let's pray that now. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. A God who on this day taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, Amen. Amen. And now let's confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most, Most merciful God, God we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 
Our psalm today is Psalm 104, verses 24 through 34 through 35. It's on page 736 of the Book of Common Prayer. We'll join together saying it responsively by whole verse. Man goes forth to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the great and wide sea, with its living things too many to number, creatures both small and great. There move the ships, and there is that Leviathan, which you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. You hide your face, and they are terrified. You take away their breath, and they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works. He looks to the earth, and it trembles. He touches the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please him. I will rejoice in the Lord. Glory to the Father, Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was was in the beginning, beginning, is now, now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, They were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy and I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we are blessed for to be able to hear some special music. It is a piano duet, Be Thou My Vision, by Amy Bloomquist and Loretta Love.
Our gospel is from John chapter 15. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts and our minds that the words of Christ might become true in us this day. Amen. Amen. A couple weeks ago, I was looking through some old photo albums. You know how they are. These are photo albums about our kids, and it has all kinds of pictures of them as children growing up. But one of the things that I noticed that was a bit strange in them is that, well, for my oldest daughter, Jenny, we had like a couple of these albums packed full of pictures. It's like every time she turned around, we were snapping the photos and putting them into the book, and that's really great. Then John, my second, came along, and, and he had a whole one filled with pictures. And it kind of makes sense because we, well, one of us was taking care of a kid, and the other had hands free to take photos, and so we've got about mm, maybe half of what we had for Jenny, but then I noticed that my third child, Joshua, he's got a nice book, but it's got almost uh, two-thirds of it empty. It's like that's all the pictures we have of him, but if you really think about it, we were so busy having three kids under the age of four, nobody had a free hand to take any pictures. Sure, we love Josh just as much, but there's not a whole lot of documentary evidence in the book that tells us about Josh. Now, I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, it's kind of the same way with God. What I mean is that when we talk about the Holy Trinity, the three in one, what we see is that same sort of, well, disparity. Because think of it, in this photo album, what we find is that God the Father is all through the book, like beginning to end. No doubt, lots of photos of him. And then Jesus comes along in the New Testament, and, and the whole book of the New Testament, the whole section is filled with Jesus. They even make movies about Jesus. Clearly, he's getting some airtime and some photos taken of him. But then we come to that last part of the Holy Trinity. Which one was it? Oh yeah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, what we find is it's kind of tough to find very many photos in the album. In fact, it's like the Holy Spirit rarely gets any airtime. We oftentimes overlook the Holy Spirit. We don't hear much teaching about the Holy Spirit. Sure, we talk about him in the, every time we say the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and every year on Pentecost, we celebrate the Holy Spirit, but I'm thinking that there must be more to the person, this third person of the Trinity, that would be helpful for us to know. So that's what I want to do today. I want to open the photo album, this one, 
and see the snapshots of the Holy Spirit that are there from the beginning to the end. I want to, instead of looking at all the drama of fire, tongues, and different languages that came on that first Pentecost, I want to kind of step back and talk about just the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to start looking at some photos in the album. And, and the very first photo that's in the album comes at the very beginning, page one. It's a photo album of creation. It's Genesis chapter one, verses one to two, and it goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That's the snapshot that we get. That's the first picture that we have of the Holy Spirit. What we see is there at the very beginning of creation in all the midst of the chaos and the darkness and the raging of the sea, there was the Spirit of God in the center of it, which is a significant truth. Because you see, we always talk about believing in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth. And we talk in the Gospel of John that all things were created through Jesus. But what we realize in this first snapshot is that the Holy Spirit was literally the hands and the feet of God doing the creation. He's there in the middle of it, at the birth of the stars, at the forming of the planets, at the creation of life. It's, in a sense, the active force of God that is at work then and now was the Holy Spirit hovering over the face of the waters. The importance of that is that in our lives, the presence of God is the Holy Spirit. That where God is at work in you and I, it's because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is hovering in here, inside of us. That's snapshot number one. There's other snapshots in here. The second snapshot comes a whole lot later in the album. In fact, this snapshot comes from Numbers chapter 11. You see, it comes at a point where Moses has led the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness. And it is a really tough slog says that there's like 600,000 people that Moses is trying to lead, and they're out in the desert, and they're hungry, and there's a lot of them, and that is never a good combination. And so they begin to murmur, and they complain, and they, they wail at the entrance to their tents. It gets so bad that Moses finally just cracks. He has a conversation with God in Numbers 11, and what he does is he says, God, I can't take it anymore. I can't do this. If this is how you're going to treat me, then just kill me now and get it over with. Do not make me face my own ruin. Moses had come to the end of his resources, and at the end of his resources, that's where we get this second snapshot of the Holy Spirit. Because what God does, he says, I can take this. I can handle this. And he says, here's the plan. You find 70 elders from all the people of Israel, and you pull them aside, take them to this place, and I will put my spirit upon them. I will fill them with my Holy Spirit the way that I am filling you, Moses. And so Moses does that, and 68 of them show up. I think two of them were Episcopalians. They were thinking they'd get there by the time the gospel reading occurred. But unfortunately, that on that day, at that time, the Holy Spirit fell on all 70 of them. And the 70 began to prophesy. They began to say things and speak things just like Moses had been doing. It was something so distinctive that people knew there's something going on there. The 68 of them, they were all together prophesying, but the problem is, is that there were two, the late ones, that were in the camp. God's Spirit still is poured out upon them, early or late, and they begin to prophesy. And Joshua, the son of Nun, gets a little bit nervous. In fact, he comes running to Moses, and he says, Stop them. Don't let them do that. They're usurping your power and your authority. And this is where we get this next snapshot, because in Numbers chapter 11, verse 29, Moses gives a reply 
that is one of my favorite passages in the whole Old Testament. Moses says this, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. I wish that the Lord would pour out his spirit on all of them, which is a profound insight. In fact, it's radically revolutionary. Because, you see, Moses understood what it was like to have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of him. Moses had discovered that with God in him, the Holy Spirit in him, suddenly he was able to do things that no human being alone could do. He could stand up and challenge Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler of that day. He could lead people, all these people, through the wilderness without GPS. He could somehow put up with all of their murmuring and complaining. And all of that was possible because Moses understood that the Spirit of God was in him. And so Moses wants that for everyone. I would that the Lord would put his spirit on every single human being so that they would have all of those same resources inside of them. That's the snapshot of the Holy Spirit. And you see Moses with clarity about that vision. Now, unfortunately, <clears throat> it wasn't yet time. But that vision was there. And that vision began to take root, which leads us to the third snapshot. This one actually is in the book of Ezekiel. This one is the prophet Ezekiel, and he is writing to a people in exile. They have been invaded. They're country has been destroyed, they've been hauled off to exile, and there in exile they are experiencing all this guilt and shame of how they have blown it. I mean, they were given the covenant of God, he gave them some very simple rules, he said, I need you to do these things, you keep your covenant, I keep mine with you, and they had busted it. In fact, the saddest thing in the Old Testament is how God gives them the covenant and they break it. And then it's renewed, and then it break it, and then they 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 break it. It's almost as if these people are incapable of being holy as the Lord is holy. And stop for a second. I'm incapable of that too. In fact, it seems to me that every time I have something I know I'm supposed to do and I fall short, I fail, I drop the ball, I sin, I err, I... Ever. Then I think, oh, I'm going to resolve to do better, and I'm going to keep that commandment, and I'm going to be really good. I'm going to get to that holy place. I will be righteous, and then inevitably something else comes up, and it begins that same cycle that the Israelites have. And the reason is, is because all of us need to come to that place where we realize we can't keep all the commandments. We can't be holy as God is holy by ourselves. And this is the key, because Ezekiel, writing to those people, sees that vision that Moses had, and he makes a promise that God has given, and it's an amazing promise. This is what it is. Ezekiel chapter 26. God says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you, and move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws. It's a radically different covenant that God is promising to make. And it's not a covenant that we could do on our own. It's a covenant that we can keep because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. In a sense, God says, I know you can't do this on your own. You can try, but it isn't going to be effective or get accomplished. But here's the thing. If you let me, I will take my Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that hovered over the waters, the same Holy Spirit that was with Moses and those 70 elders. I'll take that same Holy Spirit and I'll put that inside of you. And what you'll discover is that that Holy Spirit's power suddenly begins to make it possible for you to walk in the ways of Jesus for you to demonstrate love and grace and forgiveness and compassion, for you to do the things that you never thought you could do and you can't do on your own. That's what Ezekiel is promising. He says, there will come a day when my spirit will be in all of you. And then you will discover that covenant can be kept. That's 
an amazing snapshot of great hope. But Ezekiel wrote that 500 years before our last snapshot. And the last snapshot is actually from here in the book of Acts. It's where we start to see it become true because that snapshot is the snapshot of Pentecost. We see it and we hear it in the story of all the flames of fire and all the tongues and all the rest of that stuff. And suddenly what seems to be happening is that the vision of Moses and the promise of Ezekiel are coming true on that Pentecost day. In fact, Peter stands up in the midst of their crowd and he speaks this to all of the Jews that were there because he knew that they were longing for the promise of Ezekiel to come true. They wanted that power of God in them. And Peter says, that's what's happening. In fact, he says it like this. He quotes the prophet Joel. He says, this is what's happening here. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Not just Moses and the kings and the prophets and the holy men, but on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. You see, what Peter was realizing is on that first Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was not just being given to a select few, not just the 120 that were in that upper room, but upon all of humanity upon all of us, young and old, male and female, slave, free, anyone who comes into the Lord, the Spirit of God can be put onto them and they will have that same power. They will discover a radically different life. A life not just filled with God the Father, not just focused on God the Son, but empowered, equipped, transformed by God the Holy Spirit. You see, these snapshots of God the Holy Spirit are really all we need. The Holy Spirit's not always out in front trying to get all the attention. That's for the Father and the Son. But what the Holy Spirit wants to do is to be in me, in the midst of my ordinary life, and in that ordinary life, somehow making it extraordinary making it holy. And he wants to do the same for you. So on this Pentecost Sunday, do not desire flames of fire to be speaking in other languages. All that's kind of fun and exciting. But instead, desire that these snapshots of the Holy Spirit would not just be written in a book, but instead they'd be written on our hearts. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Your people long for you, long to know your presence and your power in our midst. And so this day, come, Holy Spirit, please. Amen. Let's join our voices together and proclaim our faith. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. It's on page 96 in the Book of Common Prayer. And as we say it, notice how we talk about the Father and the Son, and then there's the Holy Spirit. Together let us say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Together, let us pray the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Prayers of the people. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but re may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. And now we have a time of personal prayer for whatever needs might be upon your hearts or whatever thanksgivings. Let's pray together. I ask your prayers for the people of India to get control of the virus. I ask your prayers for the Middle East, that Israel and the Palestinians stop fighting. Father, we pray your healing for all people, especially those we name now, for Richard, for Mary, for Anne. Pray, Lord, for those who grieve, those who are alone, for the mentally ill, for those experiencing injustice. Father, we ask that your spirit would be poured out upon all people, because only through you will we see this world transformed. Amen. Okay. Let's join our voices in the prayer of St. Christostom. Let's say it together. Almighty God, you have given, given us grace at this time with one accord to, to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before the blessing, just a couple announcements that I wanted to make. The first is that um, if you know anybody in the Lincoln area that's maybe mm, four years old through fifth grade, um, you might consider signing them up for Vacation Bible School. That's going to be coming up the end of June. Registrations are available right now. They're on our website and I think on our Facebook as well. Um, we've got an exciting team of people that are going to be working on it, and I can't wait. So I'm hoping that you'll 
know somebody that might need to come to that. And if you're interested in joining us for that, then come on out. Any one of those days, June 28th, 29th, 30th, 31st. No, nope, not the 31st. The 1st of July. Um, we'd love to have you see what's going on in this place. The second thing is, is that there's a lot going on in our children's ministry. Um, we have had a matching grant. We are already receiving donations for that that would allow us to do even more over the course of these next 12 months. We're more than halfway there. If you would like to make a contribution to that, um, by all means, just uh, send us a check or um, you can go online and just um, do our tithely. I'll fix that. I think there's a problem with it. But anyway, we'd love to have your part in that as well. And finally, we have these altar flowers that are given to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for the blessings of Michael, Tara, and Caden by Larry and Roxanne Graham. And now for the blessing. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.